Welcome to First Baptist Church Indian Trail. Take your Bible, if you will, look with me to the Gospel of John, the 19th chapter. John chapter number 19. Uh, I want you to pick it up with me this morning in verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, says, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar. They filled a sponge with vinegar, put it uh, upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, to tell us time. It is finished. And he bowed his head uh, and gave up the ghost. Um, 1993, on a Sunday afternoon, I was uh, watching the Masters golf tournament in Augusta, Georgia. Um, The winner that year was a guy by the name of Bernard Longer. Um, He had won before. Wasn't my favorite golfer. I always pull for somebody from the United States to win, and he was from Germany. Uh, But my opinion of him changed dramatically that day. As he donned the green jacket, the interviewer asked him how important a win that was to him. And he made a statement that day that I have never forgotten. Every time I hear his name or see his face, I'm reminded of the profundity of that powerful statement. He said, it's extremely important to me, especially when it, on the day of the resurrection of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. What a victory statement. You know, volumes have been written, really, of quotes of victory statements. But the greatest victory statement ever uttered from man is found right here in this verse. To tell us that it is finished. Now that statement has major implications for us today. And I want to take a few minutes and I just want to talk to you about what it means to have finished his work. What it means to you and me, this wonderful powerful victory statements. As I said to you last week, there are a a lot of things that Jesus said from the cross that anybody could say, but very few things that uh, you and I could say that he said there. And this is one of those amazing statements. But you see, everything that Jesus ever went through, he went through as a goal-driven Man, In John chapter 4, verse 34, the Bible says, Jesus saith unto them, My meat is to do the will of him that sent me and to finish his work. So when Jesus said it is finished, what does that mean to you? Well, first of all, it means that prophecy was delivered. I shared with you last week that About 380 particular prophecies are in the Old Testament that pointed to Jesus. 380 times God put in the Old Testament, my Messiah is coming. And he gave us prophecies and promises that said, when you see this happen, you will know that it's him. When you see this occur, you will know that it is Him. I read an interesting sermon and listened to an interesting sermon uh, the other day by Vance Havner called Look Who's Here. If you want a great sermon, go to YouTube and watch that. It's powerful. And uh, this is kind of the way it was here. When you see this happen, look who's here. Uh, Look who's here. The one that I told you is coming has now arrived. Now, the Old Testament is a lot like that uh, jigsaw puzzle uh, that is on my table at home. Uh, That's one of the things COVID has done so wonderfully for me, (sighs) is reintroduce me to jigsaw puzzles, glory to God. 
frustrating thing I think I've ever. But it's kind of like that. And, and, and you understand that there's little pieces that you put together and they make this beautiful picture. Well, the picture and the meaning of this jigsaw puzzle of the Old Testament is none less than Jesus uh, himself. Jesus said in Luke 24, this is what I told you. Now, keep in mind, he's talking to the two disciples on the Emmaus Road. Uh, he's in his resurrected state. They did not recognize him, and so he drew near to them, and he started talking to them, and they communicated together, and here's what Jesus said to them. Uh, this is what I told you while I was with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written, that Christ will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. So Jesus is saying, you, you, you saw that in the book of Genesis and all through the law of Moses, you saw it in the prophets of Zechariah and Isaiah and others. You saw it in the wisdom writer and in the Psalms and they all were talking about me. My name may not have been in there, but it was all pointing to me. It was all relative to me. It was all talking uh, about me. And he was, the Bible says he opened their minds to the scripture. Isn't it wonderful that you and I actually have a better handle on the Old Testament than those that lived in those days because we're living on this side of the resurrection. So the prophecy was delivered. Second, the implication is, is that it pleased God's demands. Tetelestai pleased God's demands. It's a judicial term, if you will. Uh, when a prisoner was let out of prison, uh, the warden or the judge, whoever was doing the releasing, would stamp on his release papers to telestai, which literally means justice has been served. He has paid what he owed to society. Now, when we talk about uh, satisfying the demands of God, what are we talking about? Well, the Bible says that the wages of sin is what? Is death. Romans 8 says that the law of Moses could not save because of our sinful nature. Do you know that nobody's ever been saved by keeping the Ten Commandments? Nobody's ever kept all of the commandments except Jesus. And even if one could keep all of the commandments and live from birth to death and never broke one of the Ten Commandments, he still couldn't be saved because he was born with a sinful nature. Romans chapter 8, the Bible says, For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin condemn sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Listen, Jesus came along and did for us what we could not do for ourselves. He kept the law perfectly. Now, the law was never intended by God to save anybody, but to show the utter futility in trying to keep the law, the law then became condemning rather than saving. In Colossians 2, the Bible says, plotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was granted against us, which was contrary to us, and took it out of the way. He's talking about the law. And took it out of the way, nailing it to his cross. <laughs> How many of you would like to go to the mailbox tomorrow afternoon? and open up an envelope that said from your Visa or your MasterCard or your um, American Express or Discover or whatever it is you carry around that's been maxed out forever. <clears throat> and you, uh, you opened up that envelope and said, all of your charges 
have been taken care of. You no longer owe anything to Visa. You no longer owe anything to MasterCard. We understand that's exactly what Jesus did for us uh, on the cross. He wiped the record and the slate clean. He enabled us then to go to heaven when we die. And you go to him and you say, well, now wait a minute, Lord. Um, you know, w what about that adultery that I committed? Jesus said, what are you talking about? The debt's been paid. It's been canceled. I, I don't even have a record of that anymore. But well, what about my unfaithfulness? Unfaithfulness, I don't see that here on your record. That's been wiped clean. Well, what, what, what about those lies that I told? And Jesus said, I don't have any record of that. That has been erased from you. That, that's what Jesus did for every one of us when he shouted from the cross to tell us die. God's demands have been met. The Bible says, for Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believes. The next thing that he did is that he, it almost sounds the same, but it's really different. He paid my debt. Now, this is a priestly term, to tell us die. And it has everything in the world to do with the sacrificial system. And the priest would go and uh, they would have to find not just any old mangy lamb, they would have to go look for a lamb that was without spot and without blemish to be able to bring that lamb and offer the lamb up as a sacrifice for the sins of the people that rolled their sins forward for another year. And so they would search and they would look and they would ultimately find that lamb. And the priest would shout, to tell us die. I found it. It's done. Our search is over. Um, it is Complete, it's also a business term that uh, when a customer would go into an uh, establishment and they would find something that they wanted to buy, they would carry it to the proprietor and the proprietor then would stamp uh, on the receipt to telesty. Uh, all of the charges have been paid. Uh, all of the fees have been satisfied. It is paid in full, by the matter of fact, archaeologists have found many of the receipts that had the word to tell us die written on it from somebody that had purchased something at a store and the proprietor had said, okay, you can take it on out of the store now because you have paid for it. You understand Jesus is our payment for death. He says, I am that spotless lamb. I have paid it all. In Colossians chapter one, the Bible says, in whom we have redemption uh, through his blood, even the forgiveness of sins. Which sins? All of them. All of them. Now, let, let me say to you, our salvation is not like your credit cards. Uh, your credit cards are set up on a revolving charge. You go buy a house or you go buy a car, you, know, you pay a payment, but there's interest that is added to the balance every month. And, and you may buy a car, you may pay for that car two or three times when you've got set up on a big interest loan before it ever gets in. Somebody, you may never get them. That house, you may never get it paid for. But let me just say that salvation is not set up on a revolving charge where interest keeps being applied. Jesus once and for all paid our sin debt and you don't have to keep trying to pay it yourself. I know a lot of believers, I know a lot of Christians that keep trying to pay for it. They'll receive Christ and they will trust Christ as Savior and Lord, but they somehow still feel like that they have to go around paying the price for their own sins. 
I got to do this, I got to do that, I got to add this, I got to add this, and if I don't do this, I, I, I'm, I'm going to miss out, I'm not going to get in. Let, let me just say to you, friends, once and for all, Jesus paid our debt. He said, to tell us die, it is finished. Let, let, me, let me say something here about it. it. This is an opinion that I have, I, 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 but, I, you know, I'm, I'm accurate. Um, <laughs> I believe it's the greatest words ever uttered on this earth. It is finished. There's some equal words I believe we're going to hear when we get to heaven when he'll say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Hmm? Powerful words. So there is a prophecy that has been delivered. There is a pleasing of God's demands. He paid my debt. Fourth, he prevailed over sin and death. To tell us die. It's a battle cry, if you will. Oftentimes, uh, in a war setting, the general, after the battle would be won, would shout, to tell us die. It is finished. We have won. Stick a fork in them. They're done. It would also be in a wrestling match uh, when the victor, after having pinned his opponent, would shout, to tell us die. He's done. I overcame him. It's finished. The battle has been won. You understand when Jesus shouted from the cross, he was shouting a shout of victory. Uh, when the power of death hallelujah, lost its grip on those who place their faith and their trust in Jesus. Romans chapter 5 says, For by one man's sin or offense, death reigned by one. Who's he talking about? He's talking about the first Adam. For by one man, when he sinned, when he disobeyed God, he brought death to everybody and it reigned on everyone. Now watch this. Much more... <laughs> But greater is this, they which receive abundance of grace of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. What, what is he saying? Well, death came to man because of the first Adam, but there's something a whole lot bigger and better is that now then when we receive the grace and the righteousness of Jesus Christ, we can live forever. He has overcome what the first Adam did and brought death, he has brought life. Now, let, let me give you in a more practical sense for just a minute. What does this mean for me in my day-to-day -day living? It means that the very moment that you place your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, he takes up residence in you and greater is he that is in you and it is no longer you and your willpower that is trying to overcome some sin or some habit or some addiction. Jesus said, I have come to reign in you to bring life and do for you, in you, through you, by you, what you can't do in your own willpower, in your own strength, by your own means. Uh, listen to the scriptures in Hebrews 2. For as much then as the children, we are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is the devil, and deliver them who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to bondage. May, may I just say to you, some of you have been fighting addictions some of you have been fighting bad habits and, and losing all of the time and, and strongholds have been built up into your life. The Word of God has said that the power of the life of Jesus Christ will tear down those strongholds. He overcame them by the power of his resurrection. I know a lot of Christians that are afraid to die. By the way, can I just say to you that the fear of dying is straight from the devil? He wants to put fear in your heart. 
He wants you to be afraid. So that ultimately, he wants to destroy uh, your life. And if you're afraid to die, then you're not ready to live. I want to tell you, I'm not afraid to die. For 51 years, Jesus Christ has been my Lord and my Savior. For 51 uh, years of my life, he has become my friend. Jesus didn't want us to be afraid to die. He wanted us to be able to walk through the valley of the shadow of death and not be afraid. Why? Because, because of the power of his resurrection, he lives in us. He is with us. Let me share with you that number five, I like number five, he pounded the devil. He pounded the devil. Now, I think you'll agree with me that if we were standing at the foot of the cross and we looked up and we saw this mangled body of a human being and the blood streaming, the hole in his side, nailed to a cross, beaten beyond recognition. From a human standpoint, it would appear to all of us that Satan had won. And I suspect Satan probably was, man, look what I've done. Look what happened. I've won. He's dead. <laughs> But three days later, he's thinking, what have I done? I've underestimated. From a human standpoint, it looked like the devil had won. But Colossians 2.15, the Bible says, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. You say, well, I want to tell you what, preacher. Uh, you say he's overcome the devil. He's still pretty alive in my life. He's still pretty active in me. He's sure coming against me. Well, I want to give you a crude illustration for a minute. I don't know how many of you grew up on a farm like me, but I grew up on a farm. And uh, about every week, uh, mainly on Sunday, especially if the preacher was coming. Now, my family didn't go to church but they'd feed the preacher, beatingest thing I'd ever seen in my life. <laughs> and the preacher would come in and uh, we'd have to go out into the yard and catch a chicken and either wring that neck or put him on the block and chop his head off. Now, I know that's a little gross, but it gets funnier. That chicken with his head chopped off headless, would go running around all over that yard. I'd laugh until it started heading toward me and then it wouldn't get funny after that. <laughs> but that thing was flopping around everywhere out there without his head. Do you know that that's exactly what's happening with the devil right now? He's dead and he doesn't know it and he's just flopping around right now headless. But one of these days, one of these days, He's going to get what's coming. To tell us that it's finished. Prophecy was delivered. Pleased God's demands. He paid my debt. He prevailed over death. He pounded the devil. Kathy and Andrea went with me to Mount Rushmore a couple of years ago. Found out some strange things up there that I, 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 I guess maybe I'd forgotten or never knew. But Mount Rushmore, the, where the guy goes up and he carves out the heads of the presidents, so, was never finished. The guy who did it um, just got done. His son worked on it about four months and he quit, but it was never finished. I've done a lot of funerals. I don't know that I have ever done a funeral of anybody that could honestly, genuinely say that they didn't have some unfinished business. Jesus left here having completed everything that God gave him to do. 
to Telestai. I've finished. I've completed. Fulfilled all the prophecies. Paid all the debt. Took care of the devil. I've done everything my father gave me to do. I read a lot of Charles Spurgeon stuff. Matter of fact, I stood in his pulpit in his church in London. Spurgeon had a sermon that was uh, entitled a little bit differently than what you uh, may know. It says, the unfinished work of every Christian. You know what the unfinished work of every Christian is? To tell everybody what Jesus has done. You, you understand the difference in Jesus and Christianity and the rest of the world's re religion is only two letters. World's religion says do, 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 do. Jesus said it's done. It's finished. It's completed. I guess every preacher probably has told the story about a guy who came running up to the pastor after the service was over, the invitation was given, people were leaving, he comes up and he, pastor, 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 what do I have to do to be saved? Pastor says, sorry brother, it's too late. What do you mean it's too late? What, 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 what can I do? And the pastor says, nothing, it's too late. It's already been done. Some of you are still struggling with that. This thing of salvation is that you want your hands in it. You, you, you believe that there's something that you can do, but that's not true. The only thing that you can do is receive what God has already done. Place your faith and your trust in the Lord Jesus. Where were you when you did that? Have you trusted? Have you placed your faith and trust in him? Does Jesus live his life in you? Oh, friends, if not, today's the very day that you ought to say yes to him. Many of you in the confines of your home or watching on a tablet or some other mobile device, right in the confines of where you are, like many here in this auditorium need to do, is to bow your head and close your eyes and just simply trust what Jesus has already done. Would you do that with me right now? Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Father, I want to thank you for the numbers of people that you have allowed to hear this message this morning. I thank you that there are even many that are lost in their own sin on their way to a godless eternity. Oh, Father, may today you open their eyes to see their need for Jesus and the tremendous way in which he has already provided a means for their sins to be forgiven for their names to be written in the Lamb's book of life to go to heaven when they die. Oh, Father, would you save that soul this morning that is nearest eternity. Forgive their sins. Receive them to yourself before it's too late. Thank you for watching Decision for Life. Our location, life group, and program information are available online at fbcit.org. We hope you will take the opportunity to join us in person. Thank you from the family of First Baptist Church Indian Trail.